Hello again, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. She was Viola Liuzzo, a daughter of the South gone north to Detroit, a woman, a white American, who could not abide the images of inhumanity against black Americans that poured from her television set during the movement days of the 1960s. She resolved to lend a hand, and in 1965, she drove from Michigan to Alabama, where she died, shot to death while helping transport other civil rights workers. Three of the four men involved would go to prison, though not for murder, and Viola Liuzzo would die a second death in a turn of events only slightly less horrific than the savagery that had ended her life. These are the children of Viola Liuzzo, three of her five, and they've come to another civil rights battleground, the Central High Museum and National Park in Little Rock to help observe the 57th anniversary of Central High's desegregation. They are Mary Liuzzo Lillibo, Sally Liuzzo Prado, and Anthony Liuzzo. And we thank all three of you very much for being with us. Thank you thank for you. having us. To whoever wishes to start, remember your mom. What do you or children? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start. I'm the oldest of the three of us, although we have an older sister and another brother. Um, I remember how we were taught and how different we were taught as far as values. My mom taught values not by giving us answers, but by giving us questions. And she taught me and nurtured empathy in me as a child. I read Black Like Me and um, This Is My God and Yes I Can before I was 14 years old. And my friends and I would be sitting around the table listening to my mom and talking to her because she talked to us about things that nobody else was talking to us about. But probably the thing I remember most was that she would ask me questions and ask me to imagine what it would have been like if I had grown up and never seen a white face on a television show or never seen a white model on a magazine cover, never saw a white Santa in a department store. And she told me to think about that and to try to think how I would feel. Where did she get that? Where did she get that empathy? Where was that? Well, well she grew up, like you said, she grew up in the South and she would tell us about a lot Same. of people, though, Anthony, a lot of people grew up in the South. Well, I know, but she, it, it hit her and struck her when, it, well, she told me about one time with a drinking fountain. And she went to go get a drink, and it was the colored only fountain. And her mom said, no, oh, no, you know, come on, you have to go over here. And, and she, that struck her at a young age. She was, so she was what, nine or 10, I believe. And, and I think that just really hit home, and she really started noticing the difference, the segregation, the, um, the colored, as I said, bathrooms, colored drinking fountains, right. colored, uh, you couldn't go into a, a, a food counter. And it hit her, you know, it hit her that that was wrong. Why? I don't know. I, I, that was a unique thing of Viola Liuzzo, that she was. She was an extraordinary human being. She was not like everybody others, not like the other moms, not like um, she stood out. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind. And even her own sister said she was always boisterous. She was always, you know, outspoken. And so this was something inherent in her from a small child. To borrow a phrase, she wasn't built to uh, make cookies and have tea. Well, she did that too, though. She did, yeah, she, mm -hmm. did. she did that too. But I think too that sometimes we 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 think that, but you know, here we are together, and here we are in Little Rock. And she got in her car by herself, and she went to Selma, and there were twenty-five thousand other people there who thought like she thought, and that somehow through it all, we do find each other, and we do come to together, and we do make a difference. And I think that's something that she knew or sensed that we can develop and we can see and we can realize. Yeah, the literature suggests that your mom was watching night after night, she was watching th this trauma unfold on her native soil. And do you remember her watching that? Do you remember her talking about it at the time? With yes. Yeah, actually, 
March 7th, Bloody Sunday, was the day before my birthday. And um, she was... Now, Bloody Sunday was the march at, at Bloody, the Edmund Pettus that's Bridge. That's right. When they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge and uh, they released the the dogs, the horse, uh, the state troopers on horseback and, and just started beating the demonstrators. And uh, she, she, she was actually crying, no, seeing that and just couldn't believe. And Mary, you, you said she just, uh, you know, it just struck her so bad that she had to do something. She could not sit and just not do anything. And, and make no mistake, she knew that she was going into a dangerous situation. But she had, as Mary said, empathy and love for humanity that overpowered it. And your reaction was what? Did you, did, who tried to stop her now? Her, your my dad. My older sister. <laughs> my older sister did, tried to stop her too. So did my dad. Yeah. But it wasn't an unusual move for her either. In our lives, it wasn't unusual. There were, believe me, from the smallest thing to the drive-in theater not putting Pinocchio on as the first movie and her getting out of her car and getting all the mothers together and before she got back to the car, Pinocchio was on the screen. I mean, that started when we were little. Mm -hmm. she, if it was wrong, she moved. and. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a surprise. Do you remember when she drove away or the hours before she drove away? What's she stuff? left from school. Yeah. She sure. had packed her clothes and put them in the car and called my dad because she knew that if she came home, dad was going to talk her out of it. Or try to. Try his best. Try right. Tried to. So she called she him and called said, us Why us your money? She called us every night, though. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, she called us the night before, I mean, after the march, and yeah. uh, and was all happy and up, and said she'd be home. I remember that. And uh, two hours later, she was dead. It's painful, I know, but take us to what happened. I just remember being upstairs and, and hearing my oldest sister, Penny, um, yelling up to us, my brother and I slept upstairs. At, uh, well, that tells, take back a little bit. After the phone call, my brother and I started marching around the house, joking around, you know, we shall overcome. And I mean, I was 10, he was 13, and, and um, we were excited she was coming home. My dad got rather upset and said, hey, knock it off. And I don't, you know, he knew it was still dangerous. And um, the phone call came around midnight, and my sister, I just heard my sister Penny yelling, you know, Tommy, Nino, Tommy, Nino, you know, Mama's dead, Mama's dead. And it was, it was like a fog. And honestly, I didn't wake up out of that fog for probably two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time we got downstairs, the press was already at the door because the FBI had released the uh, information to the press about her murder prior to contacting us. So it, it was, uh, my dad tried to call the White House and wanted to talk to President Johnson, uh, which he, they did talk to uh, the president the next day, but it was only after J. Edgar Hoover has said that uh, he probably shouldn't talk to the man, but if he behaved himself, he would let him do it because the man had bad character, uh, a teamster's strong arm, and um, Viola had needle marks in her arm and was sitting very close to the Negro in the car and had the appearance of a necking party. The Negro buck. That yeah. was Hoover's words. Yeah. She was sitting so close to the Negro buck in the car it had the appearance of a... a necking party. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back just a little bit. Your mom died hours earlier before that. She was had been, uh, and she was in the company of a young African-American man yes. who was also a civil rights worker. Yes. And the two of them had been assisting in basically the carpooling or the right. transporting of other That's civil correct. rights workers. Uh, head, uh, headlights appeared in her mirror. Mm -hmm. And, well, do you want to, I can tell sure. this or you? 
She, there was a 19-year-old boy from Selma, Alabama, Leroy Moulton. He was working with SNCC, which was the Student Nonviolet Coordinating Committee that was down in Selma at the time. They were spotted in Selma by a car. Now, the story goes that they, Mom and Leroy, continued to drive on down Highway 80, and they were followed by a car load of armed um, Klansmen and one FBI informant. And supposedly followed her some several miles, 20 some miles 20, or something, yeah, and then said that they overtook her car, shot into the car, and hit her with two bullets and murdered her. And the car went, veered off the road. Out of control. Now, there were four individuals in that car, yes. yeah, the, the chase car. And as you noted, one it would be later revealed had been a four, six, five, four, five, six years had been a bureau informant yeah. himself. Yes. And was pretty much wired into the FBI. Mm -hmm. It was also later revealed that he was something of a, uh, an unguided missile, something exactly. of a loose cannon. That's right. Yeah. He was usually present at some of the most violent confrontations in the civil rights movement like the beating of the free Freedom Riders, and he was also present at the bombing of the 16th Avenue Baptist Church. And so whenever there was a very significant violent act, Gary Thomas Rowe was there. All right, Mary, the story talked about what happened next was history has judged, and the documents themselves make pretty clear, was Director Hoover's great apprehension that, that the presence in the car of a bureau snitch would impugn the integrity of, of the bureau or, or cause it enormous public relations problems. Hence the studied leaking of false information about your mom. Exactly. It wasn't that he was, it, it was partially that he was concerned, but it actually that ended up really uh, working in his favor. Be, and he solved the problem, the, solved the case in a matter of hours, and it was his first success that he uh, had had. Right. And, but his, uh, his, his concern with the family was he did not want them to be, us to be held up as icons or my mom because he didn't think that our family was the type after all, and that's what Tony was saying. Our dad was a Teamster business agent with mafia ties. This was, his, and Hoover was neither a friend of the civil rights movement nor of the labor movement. So uh, it was able to kill two birds with one stone for him. But um, his, he actually used Gary Thomas's role present presence in the car to um, elevate himself and the work of the Bureau, which had failed miserably at doing anything about any civil right. rights crimes. And, and understand, we thought that he was a hero. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We thought that he was, he was a Klansman because it wasn't until a little bit later that it came out how involved it back actually until the COINTEL investigations under Senator Frank Church in 1974 that uh, we found out the truth about Gary Thomas Rowe. So we thought he was... Like Gary Thomas Rowe was the bureau the the informant in, yes, right. in the car. And um, we thought he was a hero. You know, the guy came forward, risked his life to, uh, to turn evidence and catch the guys that killed our mom. And uh, come to find out that more than likely he was the one that actually pulled the trigger and actually shot her. And um, as Sally has said, he was involved in the 16th Street Church bombing. He was involved in the Gadsden bombing. He supplied, when they did a search of his house, he had so much ammunition and firearms. Um, and the thing of it is, though, he told the FBI everything he was going to do prior to him doing it. Mm -hmm. Ramsey Clark, who was the attorney general of the whole event in Selma and Montgomery at the time, uh, said that an all points bulletin had been put out. That car had been stopped. And they were told that there was a uh, car load of four, at the time they didn't know he was an informant, Klansmen who were loaded and looking for trouble. And that information was never disseminated from the um, Bureau to the law enforcement to Ramsey Clark and he said had he been notified of what the FBI knew that he believed mom would be alive today yeah. and also excuse me they they followed that car 
the FBI, and it is in the documents, had followed that car really? from Birmingham to Prattville to Montgomery, and then lo and behold, it stops. There's no other documents about where they went from there. But they had them under surveillance from the very time they left Birmingham. No one, I think, would dispute that what successes the Bureau had in, 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 in attacking civil or handling civil rights cases owed in large measure to the use of informants where the, the Bureau was successful in infiltrating the Klan, so nobody would dispute the value, but it seemed to have gone way out of kilter, at least in the case of Mr. Rowe. Well, Michael J. Shaheen, who, um, this was in 1979, we were in Washington at the uh, Justice Department. He was in charge of the Department of Public Integrity for the Justice Department. And he told us that um, myself, Mary Lazare, and Dean Robb, who was our attorney, he told us that out of, there was one person in this country who could change the time and place of any Klan's meeting in the United States with one phone call, and that was J. Edgar Hoover. And out of 10,000 registered Klansmen, 3,000 of them were paid FBI informants, and they were in high echelon um, positions in the Klan. And this is not a popular statement, but I don't, I'm, I don't know that I agree with the fact that the informants were used to help and the FBI. I believe that a lot of the informants created the very violence that they went in and That's then right. they reported on and pretended to solve. That's and right. I believe that that was a very comfortable arrangement. At that time, we're talking about a J. Edgar Hoover FBI. Right. And I know that that sounds, but this, my brothers and a lot of other people have studied files and people. The FBI never took fingerprints off of the gun that murdered my mother. They had the weapon. They never took it and protected Gary Thomas Rowe from any prosecution by the state of Alabama or anyone else. Or well, the federals, really. The, yes. uh, l let's take it to the trial level here. Now, the, the three men who were, well, there were four in the car, including Mr. Rowe, the yeah. FBI informant. And initially, I think all four were in, or charges were brought against all four. That's that was soon enough dropped to three. Right. right. Mr. Rowe was uh, yeah, star take, well, right, 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 and it was an all-white, I believe, all-male jury. Yes, it was. Right. It was yes. all white, all male. They were drinking Coca-Colas, um, signing autographs. Yep, yeah. and um, Feet up they were the all desk. acquitted. Mm -hmm. They were all found not guilty of her murder. Uh, the trial lasted, I think, it was a day or two, and um, that was it. And um, and they made her out to be a whore. Yeah. And they belittled Leroy Moten on the stand and um, just attacked Gary right. Thomas yeah. Rowe. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, that was justice back then. That was the way it was, and everybody knew it. We knew it. Mm -hmm. My dad knew it. So when they did that, but because President Johnson ordered federal troops to protect the marchers, they were able to go after them on federal charges of violating her civil rights. And that, um, Judge Frank Johnson, federal judge in Montgomery, Alabama, had the courage to take and, and let the case go through properly. And they were found guilty and sentenced to 10 years and had to serve the complete 10 years for violating her civil rights. And uh, is that some justice or injustice in its own way or what, how do you quantify that as the children of the victim? Well, yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, it was it was a remarkable case because I don't believe that there had ever been a prosecution on that level. So so at least there was an, an acknowledgement of the crime. Mm -hmm. And that started, that opened the gates for others. Right. That right. was able, that, that caused the federal government to be able to prosecute in other cases, in future cases. And it gave them something to where it would take it out of the hands of the all white um, good old boy juries and good old boy judges. So they had something. And, I, and I've got to believe that that helped somewhat. 
What's, what's, your, what's the message, Sally, of your mom today as you see it? Um, I think the message she would want everybody to know is that our power is within our vote and that teach your young people as soon as they're of age to get out and use that vote and think of all the people that were maimed and lost their lives for that right to vote. And um, we can change the country, we can help the country. I, I know she wouldn't be happy with the contention between all the sides, you know, I know she'd want our presidents respected regardless of who they are black, white, whatever. Mom loved this country. And I think it would make her real sad to see what's going on right now. Mary? I, I think my mom loved living be creatures, whether they were animal or vegetable or mineral. And, and I believe that she really believed that if we got to the core of who we are, and, and that we could love each other and we could live in harmony. She did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she did it. She didn't, she did. she didn't, you know, anyhow, that, I just think she would love to see us really get through this. And, I, and certainly she would never stop. Anthony. Yeah, there's not much, much to add. I mean, that, that's it. She left a legacy of, um, for one, standing up for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. And uh, that if you do stand up for what you believe in, while you might lose your life, you'll gain a victory. And you can gain a victory if you pull together. Right. Stand as one and do what you need to do. Yeah, we got an unwanted visitor here. I know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. Well, no. I know. Maybe that's a signal from your mom. Maybe yeah, it's, you know, right. hey, you're leaving Time's something over. out, yeah, so I'll give yeah. you a chance, you know, whatever. <laughs> This, but her passing, uh, the years that followed were not easy for the family. I mean, how could they have been easy? I mean, that's kind of a silly observation, but, but it, they, this was a, the loss of, of your mom, anybody's mom, but in the way that she left you and in the, the scorn that was heaped upon her. It was re she didn't just lose her. She was replaced with right. all this horror, really, the, the undercover, the smear campaign, the trials, the acquittals, the, the response of the whole United States. There was a lot of good, but when you're, when you're the age that we were, it's the pain of the, of the hatred and things that are coming your way that really you feel. But I have to tell you that now, almost 50 years later, I have had one of the richest, most rewarding lives that any woman could ask for, or any man for that matter, because of who my mother was. And people said that she didn't love us, she abandoned us. But every day, when I'm here in Little Rock and I meet people here, Robin, and I'm friends with Joanne Bland and stuff, I feel my mother's love. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be her daughter and thrilled to have had the life I have had. Uh, another sister who could not be with us had a remarkable moment when one of the three who was convicted she had they came face to face many years later who wants to tell that story I actually was there yeah. and um, Eugene Thomas the driver of the car came up and asked us when we were breaking for lunch he said you know I don't expect you guys to say yes but I would love to talk to you. Can I meet, go, or he said, can I talk to you a minute? We said, well, we're on our way to lunch. Why don't you come bit with us? And he was really shocked, you know, that we would ask. And so we went across the street and sat down at this cafe. And he had tears in his eyes and he was crying. And he said, I'm an old man now. He said, I'm dying of cancer. And he said, he looked at me and he said, Sally, you were six years old. He said, how can I ever, ever ask you to forgive me for taking your mama away? And I just gave him a hug and I said, you know what? My mom would want me to forgive you. And I told him I forgave him and gave him a hug and I believed him. I looked in his eyes and I knew he was sorry. You know, whereas I looked in 
Kali Leroy Wilkins' eyes on the monitor, and that man was never sorry. But Eugene Thomas was a changed man. I really believe that. Thanks to all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. Very Ladies much. and gentlemen, thank, well, no, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the children of Viola leave so. See you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.